On October 25, 1978, John Carpenter's legendary film Halloween was released. On a $300,000 budget, the film managed to make a staggering $70 million worldwide. This may not sound big by today's standards, but keep in mind that the average ticket price for a movie back in 1978 was $2.34. The movie was, and still is, one of the most successful independent films of all time. Due to the success of Halloween, producer-director Sean S. Cunningham put an advertisement in Variety to sell his proposed film Friday the 13th in early 1979. At the time, they had only the name, the concept, and a partially written screenplay. The movie landed in theaters on May 9, 1980, and opened at number one. The film would go on to make over $59 million worldwide and was in the top 20 highest-grossing films of the year. While Halloween showed the potential for slasher films, Friday the 13th cemented that this was a very profitable genre and kicked off a wave of imitators. Numerous studios wanted to exploit the Friday the 13th slasher formula in the hopes of being the next big moneymaker. One of those studios was Motion Picture Marketing, or MPM. They wanted to make an exploitation film in the truest form. They had three requirements. The film had to be cheap, it had to be derivative, and had to be in theaters as quickly as possible. Friday the 13th at the theaters on May 9, 1980. By the end of the month, MPM had already begun pre-production on a film that didn't have a screenplay or even a name. By June, they had a genre and a plan. The genre being horror, and the plan was for this yet-to-be-named film to be in theaters by January of 1981. That meant the film had to be written, produced, edited, marketed, and in theaters within six months. Which, if you know anything about filmmaking, you know this was incredibly quick and borderline insanity. While this was going on, MPM had something serendipitous happen. The Screen Actors Guild, or SAG, went on strike. MPM saw this as a huge opportunity. Since major film studios were on hold during the strike, there'd be less competition when their film hit theaters in January. MPM hired Myron Meisel to produce the film. In college, Meisel was friends and roommates with Michael Mahern. After college, Meisel loaned Mahern some of the money that helped him to get MPM off the ground. Since their pitch was solid, MPM managed to raise $325,000 for the film before it was even written. Now with the budget, they could tailor the script to the budget's limitations. Although they had something else in mind, MPM began to develop their marketing strategy and wanted the film to follow suit. What this meant was that the production would suit the marketing's idea for how to exploit the film. They wanted it filled with familiar elements from previous slasher films, thinking that would sell audiences on the film. Quality didn't matter. With January approaching, they need to get the production in motion fast. MPM formed a business relationship with Earl Owensby. Owensby was a producer and director who ran EO Studios, a 200-acre motion picture facility in Shelby, North Carolina. They made a deal with Owensby that would take care of most of the physical elements of production, such as equipment and sets. The deal was MPM would have access to all of this for a certain period of time for a flat rate. This enabled them to get up and running quickly since they wouldn't have to purchase or rent all these items individually, and made the production possible within their budget. Still, they couldn't afford to build many sets and went location scouting for areas in the local Shelby, North Carolina area. For the writer-director, they hired Jimmy Houston. Houston had already done three films for Owensby, so he was familiar with the area and the resources that would be available to him. Houston was excited because this film was much larger than the three previous films he directed. Houston began writing the script with some input from Meisel and Mahern. They presented him with the marketing the studio had for the production, and he tailored his script around that. One of the executive producers, John Chambliss, met with the three of them and said he didn't care what was in the script as long as they could show him that every scene in the movie would be a copy of scenes that had appeared previously in at least two other financially successful pictures. Thankfully, Chambliss wasn't really familiar with the genre and went pressed about particular scenes. They just lied to him and he fell for it. That's not to say they didn't borrow from other films. For example, Wild Man was directly lifted from John Belushi in Animal House. They also planned on using camera angles and tracking shots similar to Halloween. Houston wrote the script in about three weeks, but left it open to evolve as necessary. The initial script revolved around the basic slasher formula, a killer's loose on a college campus. While working on the script, they took inspiration from Walter Hill's 1978 film, The Driver. In the film, none of the motivations were explained, and all of the psychology was eliminated. They decided to follow this and took it a step further by not explaining anything in the film. They wanted to create what they considered a pure horror film, with no one knowing or understanding the motivations of the killer. In the end, nothing is explained, which they felt was the scariest thing of all. While this was going on, MPM had some ideas about how to increase the reach of the film. They wanted the film to appeal to the usual horror demographic, 
but also to attract a younger audience that's usually too scared of horror films. So the plan was to make a slasher film with very little visible gore. They were aiming for the PG-13 audience years before PG-13 was even a thing. They wanted to reach this hypothetical larger audience that was interested in this genre, but might have been turned off by the excessive violence. Also, by not having a lot of visible gore, they could save money by not having to pay for the effects. They wanted a PG slasher film, but knew if the film got a PG rating, it would be the kiss of death. They recognized that if the film was released into theaters with a PG rating, that would be a sign that this was a watered-down horror film. So they worked to make this the softest R-rated horror film possible. They held meetings and decided the best way to get an instant R? Nudity. Throw in some gratuitous nudity and it wouldn't matter how little actual violence was in the movie. Nudity was also something they could tease in the trailer to appeal to the male demographic. Also, MPM saw how critics bashed these kinds of films over the use of gratuitous violence. So they thought if they toned it down, the film would have a greater appeal to the critics as well. With the basics in place, they started casting. Since the SAG strike was going on, they were looking at how to cast. How do you cast a film during an actor's strike? By hiring a bunch of young actors who haven't made any films yet. Since they scripted the film to be filled with characters in their late teens and early 20s, this proved to be fairly easy. As a way to save money, they didn't have a casting agent. Although with the SAG strike going on at the time, they couldn't have hired one even if they wanted to. When it came to the actors who auditioned, they were looking at people who had short resumes, mostly work from theater and college. As an added bonus, an actor getting their first break in a feature film would be cheap. For the cast, they hired a group of young adults, mostly in their teens and early 20s, as well as a few older actors for the teachers. Cecile Baghdadi was cast as the lead character Courtney. Joel S. Rice was cast as the nerdy Radish. Ralph Brown was cast as the jock Wildman. Sherry Willis Birch was cast as Janet. At the time, she was also a secretary at MPM. John Fallon was cast as Mark. Stand-up comedian Don Hepner was cast as Dr. Reynolds. For all of them, this would be their first movie. Houston specifically wanted someone with martial arts experience for the killer, so he could also do the stunt choreography. They hired Timothy Rayner, a 30-year-old ex-Navy soldier who'd been training since he was 10 and was running his own martial arts school. While casting for the actress who would do the movie's one nude scene, the director had an unusual request. He demanded that the actress they hired must also know how to play the piano. This proved difficult because they ran into cases of one or the other. Finally, they met Deanna Robbins, who could play the piano and was willing to do the nude scene. The studio was so sure this film would be a hit, they signed the cast on for a three-picture deal. If the film did well, they'd all return. Not necessarily for sequels to this, but movies within the same studio. While this was going on, the film still didn't have a name. They tried lots of titles, but nothing quite worked. Finally, one day they had a meeting and Meisel said, FINAL EXAM! Then thought for a moment and said, No, that's terrible. Everyone else in the meeting liked it, and Meisel said to keep it, but that they really should come up with something better. Before filming, Meisel had gone over the shooting script and said there was no way the film could be done as it was written for $325,000. No matter how he shifted things, he kept coming up with $375,000 at the lowest. Even with the package deal from Earl, there was no way to do it any cheaper. MPM didn't care. They said all they had was $325,000, and to make the film work for that price no matter what. They were location scouting and found a school they could shoot in, Isothermal Community College in Spindale, North Carolina. They planned to do most of their filming there. The primary location would be an abandoned dorm on campus that was in severe disrepair, complete with rotting floorboards. They sent the crew in who spent the next few days cleaning up the dorm so they could shoot there. The campus was large, so they were able to film in many of the different locations around the area. They used some sets on Earl's lot that they redressed for the shoot. The gym for the film was in Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina. One of the producers had a very important request. They had to have a character drinking Jack Daniels at some point. The producer wanted this in there so they could have it as product placement, and they loved the idea of having free cases of Jack Daniels on set. Finally, after all the setup, they were ready to start shooting in September of 1980. Since it was September, they'd be filming while school was in session. Although much of the film would be taking place at night, so it wouldn't interfere with classes very much. Owens B. had a motel on his lot, so the cast and crew all had rooms they'd be living in while filming. To keep costs down, they planned to shoot the film mostly in order. That way, when a cast member died, they could send them home since they wouldn't need them on set anymore. They planned the shoot to be six weeks, a 30-day shoot with five-day weeks. They had to film within that time because the deal they had with Owens B. was for 30 days, no more. Day one of filming. They shot a long dialogue scene with the girls in the dorm. Day two of filming. 
they shot the same long dialogue scene with the girls in the dorm. Day three of filming, they shot the same long dialogue scene with the girls in the dorm. Day four of filming, they shot the same long dialogue scene with the girls in the dorm. After four days of filming, they had two and a half minutes of usable footage. They just started, and already they were days behind schedule. Meisel met with the director to address this. Houston said the cast was inexperienced, so he was doing this so they'd be comfortable with filming. Meisel said that sounded good, but the reality was this didn't match the schedule or the budget. The next day, the shoot was pure chaos. It was taking a long time to get filming going, and when they did, they only got a few takes. Meisel pointed out how chaotic and disorganized the shoot was, and Houston responded, I just adore that, don't you? The producers had a meeting with the director to try to get things back on track. They'd been focusing so much time on the dialogue scenes when really, they needed to dedicate more time to the important scenes. The scenes that would take place later in the film. Things improved, but it was still going too slowly, and the more they shot, the further they got behind schedule. While they had cases of Jack Daniels on set, this created a problem. Everyone was enjoying it a little too much. The cast was partying when they weren't filming, and when they showed up the next day, they looked like they were up all night partying. Meisel was going over the dailies, and when he saw the close-ups, he was shocked at just how awful everyone looked. He demanded the main cast show up to view the dailies so they could see how bad they looked. They were shocked. He told them, What you do tonight, you enjoy tonight. But what you put on screen tomorrow is forever. They learned from this and started going to bed on time. The producers thought Houston would use the Jack Daniels in a frat scene, but instead he used it in a scene where Radish was drunk and talking to Courtney. There was a rumor that the director wasn't happy with being forced to shove product placement in the film, so he wrote this line into the production. Would you care to join me in the celebration? Oh! (laughs) Well, that's terrible! When they needed to fill in the background characters, they often resorted to using the crew instead of hiring extras. One of the students in the class was Todd Durham, an associate producer. The guy who passes Courtney outside the cafeteria was Lon Carr, the executive producer. The worker in the kitchen was Gene Poole, the dolly grip. Yes, that is his real name. They did hire some extras, which they bust in from other schools. As filming went on, every time a character died, they'd go home. So the cast would sing Another One Bites the Dust by Queen every time there was a death in the film. Within the film is a scene that wasn't a big deal at the time, but is shocking today. A van pulls up to the school, and some guys in masks start a mass shooting. It's all part of a school prank meant to be a red herring for the film. The students are laughing about it because they know it's fake. They shot at us. It was murder, cold blooded murder, and kidnapping. I almost got killed, and some other people were shot. How can you all be laughing? Did you see what happened? Yes, I saw it. But I also saw that the van had a Gamma Fraternity sticker on the back window. <laughs> but watching the scene today, it plays out much more seriously. If this movie was ever remade, they would most likely leave this out. While shooting the scene in the locker room, the phone they had fell off the wall and broke. Everyone panicked. They had to shoot the scene, but it was 4 a.m. and they didn't have a phone. Houston spoke to the producers, and they went to a local gas station and stole their payphone. Later in the film, Courtney stabs the killer. Only we never see it because the way they shot it didn't work, so they cut it from the movie. You can still see the knife sticking out of the killer at one point, though. The bell tower was in bad shape, about as bad as the dorm. Everything was rotting and falling apart. The scene where the killer catches an arrow out of midair was real. Rainer had trained and knew how to do this. Tim Rayner was doing the stunts and stunt choreography, but this created a problem. He was inexperienced, and people kept getting hurt. One of the actors hurt his back while being thrown into the van. When Rayner grabbed Sherry Willis Birch, he accidentally smashed her into a wall. Probably the worst was when he was fighting with Wildman. He wrapped the gym equipment around the actor's neck, and he lost consciousness for a while. These were basic stunts, and people shouldn't have been getting hurt. This worried Meisel. There was a major stunt planned for later in the film where the killer would fall down a bell tower and crash into the ground. With all these stunts going wrong, he's afraid the actor would get hurt or worse. Still, Houston didn't care and said everything would be fine. He was determined to have Rainer do the stunt and didn't want to pay for a stuntman. Finally, when it got close, Meisel went off without the studio's permission, hired a stuntman, and paid him in advance so the studio couldn't refuse. The stuntman did the stunt and it went off without a problem. The director and the studio were furious, but Meisel was happy because no one was hurt. He felt he made the right choice for all involved. A death would have weighed on his conscience, and it would have most certainly shut down the production. As the filming schedule was getting close to its end, 
They were running out of time, so they were filming all hours of the night, often going until 3 or 4 a.m. As they were running out of time, much of the final sequence had to be sped up. While normally they'd have more time to lead up to the showdown between the final girl and the killer, they lost so much time at the beginning of the shoot, they had to majorly condense things so the filming would finish on time. While the film was a collection of concepts borrowed from other films, they decided they wanted to do some things unique to this film. The first being what I already talked about, not knowing the killer's motivation. The other was the ending. One of the executives said that horror films have been having these hokey endings where they leave it open for a possible sequel. With this, they wanted to give the audience closure and have it so they knew that the killer was absolutely, positively dead. After the killer falls down the bell tower, Courtney stabs him so many times there was no doubt that the killer was dead. The actress was stabbing a pillow. After shooting for six weeks, the film wrapped. In the end, the film ended up costing $374 thousand dollars which was just under what Meisel said it would be before they started filming they hired john o'connor to edit the film o'connor was hired because of the work he had done with stephanie rothman on group marriage the working girls and terminal island after editing they sent the film off to the mpaa for a rating even with the added nudity the violence in the film was so watered down the studio was still afraid the movie would get a pg what came back shocked everyone involved the film received an x rating for violence as it turned out, the scene at the end, when Courtney stabs the killer, was deemed too much. Even though the audience can't see him being stabbed, and aside from some blood on her hands, it's relatively tame. The MPAA had issue with how many times the killer was stabbed. She stabbed him 18 times, which was too much. Going back and forth, they cut the stabbing from 18 down to 12, and that was enough to get them their R rating. With the college theme, the studio started marketing it as Halloween at Animal House. At Lanier College, they have the finest security, the best teacher-student relations, no fraternity hazing, strictly enforced curfews, Shh. What was that? and a killer. They tried to push all the right buttons for the trailer, showing lots of implied violence and even a portion of Robin's nude scene. This proved very effective. Final exam. He's come back. Despite the studio wanting to rush it into theaters in January, the process proved impossible, and the movie didn't hit theaters until June 5th, 1981, which was still fast. In theaters, the movie did relatively well. Many independent films weren't tracked back then, so going by Variety, it was reported that the film made $1.3 million. According to Meisel, he said the film, including Reynolds, grossed somewhere around $3 million. Not huge like Halloween or Friday the 13th, but not bad for a film that cost $374,000. In another grand irony, as much as they tailored the film to play down the violence, it wasn't enough for critics. The studio noted that in the past, the same critics who badmouthed slashers for having excessive violence were now badmouthing Final Exam for not being violent enough. The film launched as Final Exam, but Meisel still never cared for the name. A year after it came out, the film Hell Knight was released. Meisel saw it and said, That's what we should have called our movie. The movie did well with VHS rentals, but as was with many films from the time, it was eventually forgotten. The film did catch the attention of Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson, which influenced their blockbuster Scream. The character of Radish, the hyper-intelligent nerdy kid obsessed with murder. What happened at March College? Another football recruiting scandal? No, better. A mass murderer. Two kids were snuffed while parking at the lake. When are you going to realize that the whole world isn't made of psychopaths skulking about? But they are out there. They do exist. People are killed every day for no reason at all. Perfect strangers wake up in the morning and decide, hmm, I think it's a good day to snuff somebody. It is very much the template for the character of Randy in Scream. The film was even name dropped by Randy in Scream 2. Wait, let me guess. The house in Sorority Row? Doing the trip blood? Splatter University? Graduation day, final exam? Because the movie did well, the studio discussed doing a sequel, but ultimately decided against it. For most of the cast, this was their only movie. Some, like Joel Les Rice, went on to work in other aspects of the industry. He went on to be a successful producer, working on dozens of Hallmark Channel movies and TV shows. He had an uncredited part in the horror classic Christine. Deanna Robbins went off to do TV shows like Matt Houston and Silver Spoons before getting a part in the soap opera Santa Barbara. Houston was one of the writers on the terrific Peter Himes crime comedy, Running Scared. Then in 1987, he directed another cult classic, 
My best friend is a vampire. Tim Rayner continued acting and is still working today. Final Exam may have started off as nothing but a pure ripoff of better movies, but the end result was something else entirely. Even though the studio wanted the film to be nothing but a copy of other films, Houston worked to break the mold by creating interesting characters to inhabit the film. While it does borrow from previous slashers, which was the intention, it does do a lot of things differently. The unknown killer being the biggest. Normally with these sorts of films, we get some grand reveal as to who the killer was and why they're murdering people. Here, nothing. This leaves the audience a bit confused by the end because we're so used to getting an explanation. It's genuinely uncomfortable and does make the whole thing more scary. We don't know why this guy's killing people. It seems there's no motive. He's just going from college to college on a bloody rampage until someone stops him. The film subverts our expectations with Radish because you think he's going to survive the film with Courtney, but he gets killed. This was another thing that was taken for Scream. Randy seems like he's going to be the hero, but gets killed in Scream 2, which was the same movie where he mentions Final Exam. It's funny how a movie that was meant to be a pure ripoff still manages to have enough creativity injected into it to stand on its own and even have other films borrow from it. If you like slasher films, then you need to see Final Exam. It's an amazingly odd concoction, a pure exploitation film that robs from the best, but it still has enough of its own ideas to feel like an innovator, not an imitator.